Your Excellency, the President of the Republic of Estonia, Ms. Kersti Kalirait, Ambassadors, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to NUPI, the Norwegian Institute of International Affairs. We are very proud and honored to, to uh, and it's a great pleasure for us to welcome uh, President Kalirait, who will deliver a talk on security perspectives in the Baltic region. Hosting talks and lectures like this is an important function for NUPI, as one of our goals at the Institute is to be a platform for key persons, politicians, academics, and experts who can share unique, important, and insightful perspectives on international relations. In this context, we are eager to learn more about the Estonian perspectives on security. The historical trajectory of Estonia puts the country in a unique position to understand the most important security policy challenges in Europe today. The country used to be part of the Soviet Union, but is, as one of the Baltic states, now a NATO and EU member. This experience, in combination with the geographical location next to Russia, the Estonian perspectives on digitalization and cybersecurity, and how to approach hybrid security threats are of high importance and interest to the Nordic countries and Europe. In this way, Estonia is a key player in Europe's relationship with Russia and in developing a security policy on this topic. Before we start, I should also mention that this session will be streamed on YouTube. You're also welcome to participate in the debate on Twitter the exit is there, and the emergency exit is there. And if you need to find the restrooms, they will be at that door and around the corner and to the left. Uh, well, OK, uh, President Kalirad will deliver her 30-minute uh, talk. And then we will be happy to take a couple of questions. Uh, so without further ado, President Kalirad, the floor is yours. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I would like to thank the Norwegian Institute of International Affairs for organizing and hosting this uh, public lecture. I do believe that in addition to all the official meetings and TED -tet talks um, that I always have on my visits, it is equally important um, uh, for me to have the opportunities to forward Estonian views also to the wider audiences. And I hope to use this lecture to give um, wider overview on uh, how Estonia does see the current um, security situation and challenges in the um, Baltic Sea region, and what has been, and for that matter still is, the general Estonian approach to national security. Um, in your introduction, Mr. Chairman, you said Estonia was part of the Soviet Union. In fact, it wasn't part of the Soviet Union. It was a formal independent country together with its Baltic neighbors, Latvia and Lithuania, occupied by the Soviet Union. This occupation was never, uh, never recognized uh, by uh, uh, Western countries. And I believe that most of Estonians of my generation, even if they may not have heard always at home what had been going on 1980, uh, during the Moscow Olympic Games at least realized that some countries refused to come and uh, compete on occupied territory. And uh, this was very important for us, this support which was kept up for tens of years. The conceptual choices that Estonia made in the early 90s in uh, establishing the main principles of Estonian security policy actually are largely a reflection of uh, this, this disaster that uh, struck Estonia during the Second World War, the occupation. Unlike Finland or Norway, who in 1939 and 40 decided to step up against foreign aggression, the Estonian leadership uh, decided to capitulate without a fight to the Soviet Union. There were many reasons why this happened in Estonia and also in Latvia and Lithuania, but one of the main reasons was uh, that Estonia found itself to be without any allies in 1939. Estonia had declared itself to be neutral, which in practice meant trying to balance on the antagonism between the Soviet Union and Germany, instead of developing relations with the Western democracies. 
It was a policy that uh, seemed to work fairly well for some time, but ended in a disaster as soon as uh, the two dictatorships came to terms with each other in 1939. You all know the Molotov and Ribbentrop Pact. And although it was um, naively hoped by the Estonian leaders of that area that uh, giving in to the aggressor would avoid human uh, suffering and losses, the reality was quite the opposite. As a result, up to a quarter of the pre-war Estonian population was either arrested, deported, executed, mobilized into the Red Army or German Wehrmacht and killed on the front lines or fled to the West. Estonia was occupied for half a century and then became, regained its independence in 1991 as one of the poorest countries of Europe. Out of this very painful experience came two basic principles that uh, do guide Estonian understanding of our security and defense for the last uh, 26 years. First of all, never again will we give up without a fight because the consequences of a peaceful surrender are always more devastating. And second, never again can we allow ourselves to end up in a situation where we are left without allies on the most crucial moment. Those are the main reasons why neutrality was not a serious option when we regained our independence. Um, gaining membership um, to NATO and the European Union was a priority for Estonia from early 90s. And indeed, we did not join the European Union uh, on economic argument. Of course, uh, we, we, we saw the economic benefits, but in that campaign as well, the prevailing important argument was security. We want to be part of the value-based Western uh, family. And, uh, and those are the reasons also why defense issues in general, including um, higher defense spending, they have always been considered very important in modern Estonia and uh, more important than maybe in some other European countries. Countries with difficult or tragic history sometimes tend to see also current challenges in a historical perspective or context. And in the case of Estonia, we have learned the lesson of history uh, when establishing these national security principles. But I would say that our history would have um, left an excessive imprint uh, on how we see the developments um, in Russia, would, uh, to say that would be a, really an overkill. It hasn't. Uh, foreigners sometimes tend to think that uh, Estonian-Russian relationships ship is bad because of this past. Well, well, it isn't actually, because on the contrary, when we were trying to regain independence from the Soviet Union in the uh, end of uh, 80s and beginning of 90s, then there were no bigger allies than, uh, than Yeltsin Russia at that time. Uh, a number of well-known Russian liberals and Democrats like Anatoly Sobchak and, 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 uh, and Yeltsin, of course, they were very supportive towards Estonian endeavors. And uh, of course, uh, without the recognition of Russia, uh, of our independence, it would have been a much, more, a much harder walk to walk. And it was very much hoped uh, in Estonia that this cooperation would pave the way to uh, friendly and good neighborly relations between re-independent Estonia and, and the new Russia. And this, however, did not materialize because something went wrong in, in Russia. And the whole separate discussion would be in order if we wanted to understand why Russia has developed in the way it has during the last 15 or 20 years. But, uh, but currently we see the situation about relations between the West and the Russia much differently than we hoped, definitely, when regaining independence. And we do regret it. We are not happy about uh, this state of affairs, but uh, Allah, it is not our doing, it's not the Western world's doing, it is the Russia which does not respect its own signatures under international agreements, starting from Helsinki Final Acts and ending with Budapest Agreement, guaranteeing Ukraine their security. But we would still very much want to have different relations. This is something which I find very important to stress to you as well. Their values right now, they are different from what we held, hold so dear in Europe, freedom, democracy, rule of law and uh, respect for human rights. Their understanding is different and we are sorry about that. They have no scruples when breaking uh, the principles which we consider so important. 
when they annexed Georgian territories in 2008 or occupied Crimea in 2014. The Kremlin has used military force against its neighboring countries and their military doctrine foresees to use all other state assets against their perceived adversaries. And don't get me wrong, we do not believe in Estonia that the likelihood of an all-out war between the Russian Federation and uh, NATO uh, exists. It's, it's non-existent, basically, because uh, we trust 100% into NATO's capacity to deter. After all, it has a 100% track record. And NATO's uh, capacity to deter changes as the risk analysis changes. We've seen since Wales and Warsaw that uh, NATO has reacted to the uh, differences of, um, of the risk perception and therefore we have a very secure situation in our region. We are prepared but we are not afraid. I sometimes like to liken it to the situation that when you live in a really seismic region, not geopolitically seismic region, then you are not afraid every day. You prepare, you build houses which can withstand uh, the earthquakes, etc. But uh, when you are in a geopolitically seismic situation, you are in this sense actually better off that your actions might actually mean that nothing happens, whereas in a really seismic situation, the earthquake comes anyway. So we don't want to complain and we don't want to be taken to somebody who is afraid or, uh, or worried, um, worried excessively and day in and day out. We are, uh, we are calmly developing our country taking leadership in EU as the current Council Presidency country, but we do discuss daily uh, with our allies on how to make sure that uh, NATO's deterrence is adequate to guarantee the same level of um, feeling protected what we currently have. These relations, of course, what, uh, what we currently have, uh, have with, uh, with uh, Russia, these relations are not so different between the rest of the West and, and Russia as general we believe. And uh, we share the understanding of our uh, partners and allies that um, as long as, uh, as Russia does not recognize uh, uh, international law, uh, there cannot be going back to business as usual. No way. It's not for us to provide the way out from the current situation. There is a reason why we have taken the steps all together to uh, we stand uh, what has happened uh, during the last uh, decade um, in our Europe, in Georgia, in Ukraine. And as long as those facts on the ground stay unchanged, we don't believe that there should be any change of our, our uh, treatment of the situation. It's not for us to look for the way out. It's for those who are erring against their own international obligations. Having said all that, indeed, we still believe that uh, 1939 will not happen over again, provided we stay united, provided we stay alert. Of course, what we cannot avoid is accepting that there remains a risk that a miscalculation uh, can be made in the Kremlin, thinking that NATO will not react to an aggressive move or will not react quickly enough. And uh, this is why the decision of uh, NATO uh, at Warsaw summit to deploy NATO battle groups to the Baltic states and Poland had a serious and positive strategic influence on uh, the situation. This gives a clear signal that there are allied troops in the Baltic states constantly, Norwegians included, Lithuanian EFP, and that any conflict would more or less automatically uh, invoke the collective defense mechanisms of the North Atlantic Alliance. I'm very glad also that uh, Norway's been uh, participating in Baltic Air Police and uh, is indeed in uh, Lithuanian's um, NATO battle group. Ladies and gentlemen, we also need to always talk about our own capacity to defend. Then we fully understand that militarily Estonia can effectively be defended because uh, there's Article 3 which says you have to be yourself able to defend yourself and then on top of that comes Article 5. We have always made serious investments into our defence capabilities, structures and, and budgets. Unlike many other new member states of NATO, Estonia decided to retain universal conscription and territorial defence reserve units, also after gaining NATO membership in 2004. And in this sense, Estonia is along Norway on one of the few countries 
in NATO that has retained conscription. Some are now going back to it, Sweden, Lithuania, for example. We have always had it like you. Conscription and uh, conscription-based reserve units were retained in Estonia for the Article 3. And uh, without that, we would never be able to uh, look our allies into the eye and say, yes, we are able to protect our own territory, which, by the way, is also NATO territory. So something very important to stress, because quite often you hear the reasoning of NATO protecting Baltic states. NATO is not protecting Baltic states specifically. NATO is taking care of its own eastern flank. So um, we have always carried seriously this responsibility to make sure that we spend enough to be able to uh, protect this eastern flank. Since 2012, we are spending 2% of our GDP uh, on defence. And uh, also, uh, there has never been a serious debate about it. Should we have it or should we not have it? Even we all came through an economic, uh, economic crisis 2009-10. Even during that period, it was quite clear that uh, saving on defence budget is not uh, our way to go. And 2% um, benchmark is a sign to our allies that we do take defence seriously and we are not the free riders, we are contributors, we are not consumers of the security and we keep the promises and the pledges which we have made. Also, there seems to be a rule of thumb in defence planning that the sustainable and balanced defence budget um, is the one where personal operating and investment costs are approximately one third each and 2% of GDP seems to be the level uh, at which most Western countries are able to ensure this balance. So in a way, it's also logical to spend uh, those 2%. And finally, since 2014, obviously, we didn't want to do less to uh, invest into our own independent uh, capacity to defend and to be able to guarantee the host nation support, we've gone above 2%. Uh, 2018, we'll be spending 2.2, right now 2.17% of the GDP. So what is above 2% is host nation support for uh, NATO's allied presence uh, in Estonia and also for some uh, uh, additional uh, investment, uh, which we feel we, we need to do. Because, you know, all this debate about approaching 2% while nobody's yet really spending to get closer to 2%, this is putting the market prices up. Because, of course, we all know defence market is an oligopolistic at best, if it's not monopoly or duopoly. So, also, the secondary market, while nobody's downsizing, everybody's holding or growing, means that secondary equipment is not that readily available. And we rely, of course, very much on second-hand equipment, uh, being a relatively small economy. So while we very much welcome this push to spend more in Europe and be able to defend ourselves, we also need to understand that uh, for that spending to be efficient and effective, it might be that some countries, instead of trying to fit 2% in with their own army spending, might actually want to look outside to spend elsewhere in order to be able to make sure that uh, those parts of NATO territory which need protection will be actually not less protected. We don't have these examples in conventional. We have common procurement examples uh, together with Finland, for example, on radars in conventional. But Luxembourg has invested in cyber range in Estonia because we have a cyber uh, security of excellence of NATO and uh, this needed a range. And there has been a bilateral agreement that they will do spend. That is the value of the uh, future European uh, defense cooperation, structured cooperation for us that it will probably recognize that there will be some redistributional elements in the defense spending in the future. It's not currently on the cards. Currently, we discuss common procurement and common R&D investment, but I'm quite sure that uh, it is possible to move on onwards. I've stopped for so long on the Baltic Sea region and Estonia's uh, way of safeguarding our own territory uh, by military means. But of course, uh, that doesn't mean that uh, we, we see security and defense as a poorly military issue, or that we would have uh, geographical limitations towards um, our participation in security elsewhere. Like you here in Norway do, Estonia also believes that um, it is not only important to be a member in NATO, but also to be an active and contributing member. We try to punch above our weight if, uh, if necessary, and, uh, and if you think about it, 
we are 26 years again independent and for 22 years already we have been on international missions, EU, NATO, United Nations, because we want to contribute, not only consume. This is one of the main reasons why Estonia was one of the biggest per capita contributors to the lengthy and loss-heavy ISAF uh, mission in Afghanistan. We deployed infantry units to the most dangerous uh, region of the country, the Helmand province of southern Afghanistan, and we did so without any noteworthy national carriers. Our uh, people recognized already then when Russia was not perceived as a threat that much that what our soldiers are doing there is protecting Estonian independence. And lucky are the soldiers who are able and capable to protect the independence of their country far from their own borders. Of course, we suffered one of the highest per capita personal losses. We honor greatly those soldiers who gave their lives, helping Afghanistan, but also protecting Estonia's independence. It demonstrated that when it comes to solving common challenges, when we are not seen as consumers, but as providers of security, we can also rely on our allies and partners, look them in the eyes and say, maybe now it is turn to think about us. I do believe that our participation in Afghanistan along with United Kingdom and our very quick deployment of troops also to the Central African Republic along with uh, the French in 2014, following the first ever call of Article 42 in the European Union, they did contribute to the fact that uh, these are the two European countries uh, which are currently represented in the EFP battle group in Estonia today. Our brothers in arms, Denmark, from Afghanistan as well, they are the third framework uh, country, nation in Estonia. We're very grateful to them we have cooperated with them elsewhere, and now we cooperate with them in Estonia. Different spheres of life, of course, influence your, uh, your security. Uh, defense in 21st century definitely is, uh, is not uh, only conventional uh, defense issue anymore. Well, single vital service like electricity, for example, or other vital services they all are elements of security nowadays, and we all know that uh, either by accident or deliberate diversion, somebody could take out your electricity systems. It will mean that uh, there will be no electricity home, hospitals will soon stop working, no, no power, no money, as we all know we are very dependent on the electronics and, and electricity in general. That is also why our national security concept sees military defense as just one of six fields in security. The others being sustainability of vital services, internal security, international activities, psychological defense, and civil sector support to the military. And in many sense also the current popular catchphrase about hybrid threats or hybrid warfare is uh, nothing new or novel to Estonia. In the cyber field, we consider us to be one of the first countries that felt the impact of coordinated and politically motivated cyber attacks in 2007, and um, have therefore been an acclaimed expert on, on this field. In the wider sense, I believe that hybrid warfare as such is nothing new in the history of conflict, countering conventional with unconventional and uh, finding uh, the weakest and most vulnerable spots of your adversary using espionage, uh, diversion, rumor spreading to weaken the enemy, it must be as old as warfare itself. But the main difference in this regard between the past and the present tends to be that uh, if in the past the so-called hybrid uh, warfare elements were usually the weapon of the, uh, of the weaker and uh, non-state actor, then currently hybrid warfare is something that also um, is, is used uh, by uh, conventional and strong state actors. And in addition, technology has made it totally geographically neutral. It can happen everywhere. Uh, countries close to Russia, for example, are no more, uh, are no more prone to face an attack on their democracy than countries further afield. It's nothing to do with, uh, with where you are, but more to do with what your values are and whether you are part of our value-based Western Union or you are not. And, uh, and obviously we see also that uh, hybrid uh, has exactly all the same elements like, like conventional. There's capacity issue, 
if you are busy maybe dealing with, uh, with elections uh, transatlantically, then maybe you have less time to, to think of the uh, similar, uh, similar acts in, uh, in Europe. If there are big elections in Europe, you probably concentrate your efforts there. If there are no big, uh, big, uh, big elections coming up, then probably you will try to uh, uh, use those tools to, for example, compromise the uh, NATO enhanced power presence in the Baltic states or, or, uh, um, or Poland. So we're always ready to also counter and, uh, and, uh, and stay vigilant on, on these uh, new, new risks. I wouldn't call them cyber risks. I like to call cyber conventional the risks, which are risks to your energy systems and other vital systems. And these hybrid risks are, again, a totally different um, story. I hope that the picture I painted over the last 20 minutes was uh, not too gloomy and grim. At least I didn't want it to be such. I wanted to show you why we are prepared and how we are prepared. And um, quite regularly, some of the news headlines tend to show the Baltic states as countries on the brink of an all-out war. Then actually, the general security situation in the Baltic Sea region and Estonia is uh, stable, secure, and um, predictable. With this stability, security, and predictability, this is derived from two themes that I tried to follow also in, uh, in this lecture. First of all, you honestly need to admit that the modern world is uh, not always the safest place to be in, and that one has to prepare himself not for the best, but for the worst case scenarios. And secondly, that security is not a godsend from heaven or NATO, but something that even a small country such as Estonia can and must strengthen by its own actions. Our capacity to help uh, better understanding the cyber-related risks, our uh, cyber uh, security center of excellence of NATO, also the STRATCOM center of excellence in Riga in Latvia, shows that uh, small uh, NATO allies, we are all trying to um, punch above our weight in helping, uh, helping uh, other allies uh, to counteract the threats which we are facing commonly. Thank you for listening. Uh, I think it's now time for the questions. Uh, then I at least know I'm talking about what you really want to hear about. Thank you very much, Madam President. Thank you for sharing your important and unique perspective on the security challenges in, in the Baltic region. We will now open the floor for questions. Um, it is important that you wait for uh, getting the microphone. Uh, before you ask the question, and that you uh, please state your name and affiliation before you, you ask your question. And please uh, try to uh, uh, be brief. Could you hear, any, hear anything about uh, what I said? <laughs> okay. The gentleman over there. And then. My name is Luke Cotney. I'm an American over here for my two little Norwegian Americans. Uh, uh, who are why I'm here, uh, concerned about their security. Um, the uh, Katyn massacre was my Glasnost issue, and I think I got our State Department to take it seriously as such. Um, I am the first person I know of uh, after our Budapest uh, Memorandum Treaty Breaking Kiev coup, or near conservatives Kiev coup, uh, on Washington Post and through other channels, I asked Secretary of Defense Chuck Hagel and President Obama to get nuclear tripwire U.S. Army detachments into the Baltic states as soon as possible. And lo, the U.S. Cavalry rode to your rescue. <clears throat> My question is about nuclear deterrence. Now, it's wonderful that Norway, for NATO solidarity, has a detachment in the Baltics. But the... Uh, uh, Nobel Peace Prize this year is for um, is ba a ban the bomb peace prize um, regarding the credibility of our American nuclear NATO deterrent do you folks in the Baltic uh, is it still credible to you and maybe more importantly is it still credible to Putin his Estonian communist chief of staff Vino and the Russian general staff and sort of a corollary question, would our nuclear deterrent credibility be better if Vice President Pence becomes president? 
I have to say that um, maybe to start uh, repeat, repeating the words of uh, uh, NATO Vice Secretary General Rose Cottonmiller that if you leave Tritosphere alone and think about the real acts on the ground, then uh, we've seen uh, from this American administration something which uh, suspiciously looks like value-based foreign policy, smells like value-based foreign policy and acts like value-based foreign policy, so probably these. Indeed, we've had the visit of uh, Vice President Pence uh, uh, in Tallinn uh, to meet me and my two Baltic colleagues. Paul Ryan has visited. When I'm out uh, in conferences and seminars, uh, congressmen and, and senators regularly ask to discuss the situation in the country. And, uh, and we feel uh, that the transatlantic bond is uh, particularly strong uh, at this time, which shows that not only NATO's risk analysis, but also the United States' risk analysis is on the spot, is, is, is on, on its task, and is, uh, is actually uh, very much similar to our own. Uh, Secretary Mattis uh, knows very much how much Estonia has contributed in Afghanistan, is still ready to contribute in Afghanistan, in Iraq. Uh, we are currently there also on training missions, like many NATO allies are. So um, we have uh, all the reasons to uh, believe that our uh, defense dialogue is... Uh, is uh, as it should be, and as, as, as we hope and expect it to be. But indeed, I would now leave the discussion about transatlantic bond, but would like to turn to the uh, time it took Western Hemisphere to wake up to, uh, to the uh, situation which started to develop in my mind, uh, I would say before 2008, before Georgian war. If you remember, President Medvedev was then president, not President Putin, and they uh, made a plea to international community to rediscuss uh, principles what we have set in Helsinki Final Act. And there were no takers to discuss. But then Georgia happened. And after Georgia, we very quickly returned to business as usual. So we taught ourselves, without realizing it probably, the lesson that we don't talk to you, but if, we act, if you act, we don't retaliate. Because business as usual came very quickly. And I believe that in 2014, suddenly, we all realized, I say we, but that's because I'm polite, because we were very often called the scaremongers at the time when we said that we think something different is going on. Uh, we all realized that the, uh, that the landslide which started in, in Georgia reached Ukraine and Crimea. And of course, now when this landslide has happened, occasionally you hear proposals uh, from Russia to now build a new security architecture. Well, my question is always, can you build any architecture on slided land? I would advise not. So we absolutely need to uh, hold on to our red lines. And it's not only about Ukraine and the Ukrainian independence and returning Crimea to Ukraine, which is very important in itself. But the second red line is indeed to stop this avalanche from moving elsewhere. I'm not thinking that next stop would be in the Baltics. Some journalists uh, tend to think it, but uh, I think NATO is a really working umbrella of uh, men and equipment as uh, has been demonstrated by NATO. But there's Transnistria, there are other areas which uh, might, be, might be under threat. We also saw during Zapad exercise some nervousness in Belarus. And uh, even if now people say that uh, Belarus, uh, well, nothing happened, Russian troops left. But how do we know that without all this international melee about will they leave, they would have left? We don't know it. Gentlemen in the back there. My name is Ingvar Godal, <coughs> former member of parliament. Uh, in, uh, I think, 19th or 20th of August in 1991, there was a coup in Moscow against uh, Gorbachev. He was put aside and the power structure took power. Then the next step was to, to go into the Baltic states to try to sort of take them back in. Uh, th three of us from Parliament went to Tallinn the next day, and we were in, uh, in Tallinn that evening in the Parliament. And I I've never seen such courageous people in my life as I saw them. The uh, new power, uh, those who had taken power in Moscow, they ordered a uh, general on the biggest military base in, Tal in uh, Estonia to stop what was going on in the Parliament. And uh, he refused because he was a Chechen and had sympathy with the Baltic freedom fight. So um, they had to send some uh, columns of the tanks from Pskov. That took more time. 
we were in the parliament and they, would, they said that uh, now um, law and order has broken down in uh, Russia, so we have to take our own destiny into our own hands and they discussed uh, to a declaration of independence. And uh, while they did that, police, uh, people were building uh, barricades around the parliament and police went into position with, with arms. And I carried on business as usual. And I was thinking what would happen in the Norwegian parliament if the Red Army marched, marched up uh, uh, in, at the National Theatre. Uh, I'm not sure they would have business as usual. You carried on, you declared your independence, and uh, the, the Russian took this TV tower, but for some reason they did not take the parliament. Uh, it, I'll just mention this because uh, the, courage, the courage that you showed, uh, your people showed that evening was absolutely fantastic. Uh, I also think it is uh, very, uh, you should be praised for having spending 2% on, on defense, 2% of our GDP. We spent one and a half. Either it's Norway, you spent two. Uh, <clears throat> my question is about the uh, security in the Baltic Sea. Uh, Sweden and Finland, of course, is very important when we talk about this. And uh, my question is what do you think about uh, Swedish and Finnish members of NATO? Membership in NATO. I'm not a political journalist. I'm a president of a neighboring country, and therefore I do not comment on uh, on uh, on the aspirations or lack of them of uh, of other countries. Not at all. I have very good understanding of uh, of a uh, common understanding of the security situation in the Baltics uh, with uh, with uh, Finnish and Swedish leaders. We regularly talk. We also, by the way, work together on defense issues. For example, right now Estonians are together with two EU members, non-NATO countries, Ireland and Finland, in, in Lebanon, in Finn Irish, but, and we have various ways, as I already mentioned, we procure together sometimes, who is Finn. We all exercise together in, uh, in uh, Aurora 2017, uh, uh, organized by Sweden, not, uh, not a NATO country, and, and therefore, who is in NATO or who is out NATO, that's a national choice. The important thing is that our risk analysis is on the same page and our reactions are on the same page. Of course, your reactions would be different depending on whether you can rely on Article 5 or you cannot rely on Article 5, as President Niinistö always likes, uh, likes to uh, remind uh, people. And it is for these countries to take these, uh, these decisions. We are very satisfied with defence cooperation, with also they are NATO's uh, enhanced partners, uh, as Sweden and Finland both are NATO's enhanced partners. Uh, Torstein Korsvold, I'm a journalist with the Norwegian uh, website aldrimer.no. Um, can you give us a little, little bit of insight in uh, hybrid and uh, cyber threats? Uh, what is um, and examples, uh, preferably, of what is going on in your country? Frankly, less is going on in my country because, uh, well, we haven't had any big elections. We had local ones, but they are not normally under any kind of this kind of misinformation attack. The biggest example, what you have, and the best retaliation you have seen yet in history, was French one. There were emails in the hands of the press. They knew they could publish it, yet they did not publish it. I had already in Munich conference called, for example, that politicians who see their adversaries coming under this kind of attacks should stand by their adversaries, not use this information, declare that they're not going to use this information. In France, this happened. It was not published. It didn't affect the election result. And what was even more important, thereafter President Macron went and stood beside President Putin and says, said, this is not nice what you did, you shouldn't do it, and you did it, saying you did it. I think this was the uh, strongest act what, which you could have had in this year against the hybrid threat in a democratic country. I think it helped a lot that we didn't see a similar level uh, of, uh, of attack in, in Germany, for example. We have seen, uh, not in Estonia, uh, any acts of, uh, of spreading misinformation of NATO's enhanced forward presence. We had one chance, one try in Lithuania, but uh, our societies are resilient. I mean, we are trained, we are, we are exercised for these situations. And these exercises are not nice to, nice to hold. They deal with all kinds of crazy mi misinformation, but we are prepared because we do these exercises. And I'm quite sure that uh, we are not alone on this field. After this year, after last year, 
after what we've heard, uh, what went on also during the American elections, we are all alert. Being alert and having seen that transparency, like it happened in France, ha helps and is a great tool. I believe this is the this is the direction to take, the direction to hold. Of course, every this new attack will be uh, separate uh, separate incidents where there will be new elements. But this is the world of 21st century. Everything is always new and happens mostly once. And then you have to manage it uh, as best you can. Do you think other countries, other Western countries, might lack uh, the historical background and the resilience to describe? Uh, I described a really good example from France. And I think this put it in the center of thinking of people that you don't have to be geographically close to Russia to have this happen. And also it demonstrated that indeed resilience can be found. A uh, democratic country which is strong and transparent can fight back. If you cannot be transparent to your people because you are in other areas of life also not transparent, then it would be much more difficult. Are there any uh, more questions for uh, President Kalulian? Um, Uh, my name is Katarzyna Kubiak from the Norwegian Defen uh, Institute for Defense Studies. And hi, I have a question regarding the NATO Russia Council, which um, even despite the fact that business as usual is not possible as such, um, has met several times already. And my question would be, what does Estonia see as a possible valuable topic to be put on the agenda of the NRC in the uh, future regarding Russian NATO relations? Well, it's important that we keep talking, and, uh, and we all know that uh, there are several elements which we could have discussed also during this year in, in this format, uh, in a more open way, for example, Zapat exercise and its transparency, and, and whether, uh, whether it does uh, meet, again, the uh, international criteria for having observers over, uh, we think it met, the Russians said they didn't. So there are ample issues which we could discuss if there was goodwill on both sides. But for that, you need goodwill on both sides. As long as there is no goodwill on both sides, I believe that we need to keep talking, but there cannot be any practical results, as was clearly demonstrated uh, also, also uh, by the fact that uh, we, our Western allies, we never got the information we asked about this summer's uh, military exercises. And what we got was underestimated. Good afternoon, Madam President. I'm Henrik Seip of Statoil. So unsurprisingly, I plan to ask about energy. Uh, because you have remarkably spoken for 20 minutes without mentioning with one word, as far as I can recollect, uh, how energy uh, fits into your national security thinking. Yeah, now you probably want me to talk about gas. I'm Estonian. 9% of our energy mix is gas, so it's uh, irrelevant almost in Estonia. The reason why gas is uh, so low in our energy mix is that Russia has constantly uh, kept prices so high that renewable, particularly in heating and cogeneration, have been uh, feasible in Estonia for much longer than <laughs> elsewhere in Europe. So our heating system is now mostly renewables, wood mostly, peat as well. Uh, no gas, practically. So uh, gas, uh, as such, uh, is not a tool to strangle Estonia in any way. In the region, of course, Lithuania, which is uh, fully gas-dependent for its electricity generation after the uh, nuclear power plant was uh, shut down, mm, had to take drastic measures, uh, which were also feasible. They were not feasible if you look at the market price levels, but they were very feasible if you look at the price levels Russia was offering in, in the Baltic states uh, to install an LNG terminal. So in case, uh, in case um, we need gas and the little gas we need, we can get at least the prices of LNG terminal in Lithuania, which is uh, not uh, as good as, well, as market price, but uh, much better than we were offered before. Anyway, uh, there is another element of, of energy which people talk less about, and that's electricity. Uh, Poland left the uh, Brel grid system, uh, uh, which is uh, the Western Russian uh, grid system in 1995, I believe, uh, or thereabouts. Uh, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania are still for frequency holding dependent of the, uh, of the Russian electricity system. We are taking steps with the EU money to make sure that we are able to, uh, to operate as an electricity island, the three Baltic states. Uh, we are constantly strengthening our, uh, 
our energy connection so that we could hold frequency, the three of us together, in case that is, uh, that is um, either accidental or, or for some other reason a cut off from the Brel electricity grid. On the other hand, we are seeking to have not only energy selling connections, which we all have. Uh, we have uh, Litpol link, we have Estlink uh, 1 and 2 between Estonia, Finland, Litpol between Lithuania, Poland. But they are ECDC back-to-back -back converters. They are not frequency holding lines. We are seeking to build frequency holding lines to become part of either Central European or Nordic uh, electricity grid. Um, and uh, we, are, we are considering the options. It's cheaper to go uh, to Central European but there is one line uh, which can be transferred to frequency holding line, uh, but we need two lines in order for the system to be stable and, and also well operable at market conditions because with one really big player only on this market, uh, market will be lost. We are used to market already, so we are currently uh, discussing uh, with European Union and Poland, Lithuania, Latvia on how to solve uh, the grid issue. Meanwhile, if 15 years ago we would not have been able to withhold the sudden uh, cutoff from Brel Nowadays, we are convinced we will be able to, uh, to um, stand as an island. But uh, to make this island even more stable, we are constantly investing together with our partners. Uh, just to mention, uh, I design games. And I have designed a new board game, which is free on my webpage, uh, called Nordga Angrepet. And it teaches the importance of both preparedness and alertness, two separate concepts, and even has a little variant rule, what if there was an alliance of neutrals between the US and Norway in 1940? So uh, if Estonians like board games, you might be interested in my free game. I'll leave my card with you, if that's OK. We don't like war games at all. We'd much prefer to have a friendly, democratic, and economically well-developed Russia to trade with and, uh, and to, uh, to uh, travel visa-free. There was a discussion, you remember, years ago, we might have had a visa-free travel. We don't like at all war games. We much prefer to have a, a good and, and well-developing neighborhood. We all have many Russian neighbors. We still have uh, grassroots level contacts. By the way, our technical border cooperation with Russia is really well. Our cultural cooperation is going also really well. So we do what we can. But, uh, but meanwhile, indeed, if you talk about computer games, then that's direct advertising. I'm not reacting. Yeah, I, I think I will uh, misuse the opportunity as a chair to ask you a question. You have already talked about uh, cyber uh, attacks and cyber war and, and issues pertaining to that. I would just like to hear you talk a bit more about uh, be Estonia being a, a digital state. Um, what are the main benefits and what are the main challenges uh, connected to the security situation in the Balkans? And, uh, and also one more question. What do you see as, uh, as uh, uh, the most pressing needs in the international community when it comes to the stability of global cyberspace? Mm -hmm. Uh, international community has taken many steps in, uh, in defining uh, how global cyberspace could be secure. And the most important takeaway from both Tallinn manual process, uh, which is a legal academic discussion over cyber security in the international sphere, and elsewhere also United Nations for uh, the biggest takeaway is that if it applies in analog world, it similarly applies in the cyber world. Uh, and uh, it's mostly, you can read the uh, Tallinn Manual 1 and 2. One is for war-related situations, two are for those situations which are below the threshold. Uh, you, can, you can read them and, and you need to start thinking also, uh, well, every, every country to themselves, what they would consider an attack and, and how they would then retaliate. And we need to continue developing of our understanding. But it's always based on this principle. Analog law applies in the cybersphere. So uh, I believe that's a very important element of the defense. Then comes the uh, uh, more personalized elements of defense. And here I would like to uh, not to talk about defense only. Uh, as always, military is far ahead technologically in understanding the risks. So in cyber domain, which is a separate domain, we know quite a lot about how to defend uh, systems and what we need to do. But I'd, I'd, I believe that, therefore, the bigger risks actually lie in cyber hygiene, which is a term I like to use uh, talking about normal people in normal internet. 
but frankly there is no difference if all our refrigerators are connected to the internet and uh, and something goes wrong with them you may have uh, as big a disaster as you have on uh, on attacking uh, vital systems of uh, of country so we need to teach our people uh, how to be hygienic and uh, you may say it's not possible but after all we all taught our, our population centuries ago with far less uh, developed communicational means uh, that you need to have hygiene in general. So teaching cyber hygiene cannot be that different. And we have an encouraging story indeed referring to the digital society, what Estonia is. There was a, something which you might call a, a global, a global uh, uh, test. It was called WannaCry, zero attacks in Estonia. Because the society is dependent on digital tools, society uses digital tools to sign contracts, to communicate with government. So of course we know to update and of course we know to keep our password secrets and the physical token uh, away from passwords, etc. So it can be taught. We are an encouraging story in this sense. And indeed, since we already know from 2007 that your digital state can come under attack, we have taken several measures, latest of them and maybe most interesting is creating a, a digital embassy in Luxembourg. Uh, it will have uh, uh, all the characters of an analog embassy. Uh, uh, the data there will belong to us. Its security and untouchability is guaranteed. We have just uh, returned a copy of that treaty last week uh, from Luxembourg to Tallinn so that our uh, digital copies of our state uh, will be elsewhere available as well in case the main copy comes under attack. And there are several other elements which, of course, need to keep in mind while operating digital society. On the other hand, moving data about the nation in a digital format must be simpler nowadays than trying to copy all your papers and, and have them somewhere safe place and elsewhere. The biggest challenge of digital society, um, obviously, is to convince all other societies to become digital as well and uh, make the free trade and free services and free movement of people and everything which we have in analog world also available to us in the uh, first in the in the European Union and then also uh, wider. I give you a few examples why this is so important. For example, if you have a law which says, and this law exists, I'm not saying in which country, that the data underlying uh, tax declaration needs to be in the country and available. And this, if applied to the digital sphere, you cannot even hire an auditor or a bookkeeper from another country, whereas otherwise it would be perfectly feasible to do. So if you didn't have that law, you would have free market, but since you have it, you don't have a free market in, uh, in this particular case for services. And this is holding back uh, our continent quite considerably, we feel. So I'm happy to report that uh, during the Estonian EU Council presidency, we got the feeling we'll get the, reaff uh, the, uh, the, the uh, reaffirmation by the leaders, uh, we hope, quite soon when uh, we have presented the uh, presidency conclusions of Tallinn Digital Summit uh, that we will now move in Europe to create the fifth freedom. It's, of course, always possible to just uh, execute fifth freedom by applying all the four freedoms case by case, but it's probably more time consuming, so we're going for the fifth freedom so that we could have a more digital society. But again, this cannot be done without making sure that our people and businesses are safe in the cybersphere. One thing is hygiene. What is the other element? The other element is safe identification. In analog world, you hope you all have your passports. Your government has provided you with them, so you go to another person with whom you want to sign a contract and identify yourself. For some reason, in digital sphere, most countries have left it to private companies for, to provide this identification. They do admirably well, but this is not the state guaranteed system. There are countries in Europe, Denmark, Estonia, Luxembourg, Latvia, Finland, who do have digital identification means. But even our citizens cannot much use it cross-border. We have several agreements, for example, with Luxembourg that we recognize each other's digital signatures, but we cannot give them from the same computer. There is a technological obstacle, for example. So we have a lot of work ahead of us to make sure that our societies are digital. On the other hand, just to withdraw and say we don't go this way is not feasible. People and businesses are there. Governments, if they want to be important to people and businesses, need to be there as well. It's not that different, again, from street space, the cyberspace. It's dangerous. Street can also be dangerous. But to take adequate protection measures, highways are dangerous. You well, put your safety belts on, airbags, and then you go there. 
even if you know there will be risks, always there will be risks. Thank you. Uh, I have one more question uh, now, and I, I know that the president is on a very tight schedule, so I think perhaps we'll just close the session after that question, and then you will be able to answer that, and, and then, yeah, we will close. You told us uh, a little bit about how uh, Estonia's history has influenced the will to defend. Would you say it's uh, a strong feeling, uh, a mentality perhaps, something that's discussed and something that's re that really has a, a presence in, in defense and in, in, in uh, society? I believe there are a voluntary defense league, which is, by the way, 100 years old. Never mind if you sometimes read. Last year I've read in newspapers that now they are so afraid they've established the voluntary defense league. It's not. It's 100 years old. But having this makes sure that our society feels self-confident about defending ourselves. Because quite a high number of people not only have passed the conscript service and stayed in reserve for several years afterwards, but they continue with a certain level of military training. We are, of course, not alone in Europe uh, doing this. Uh, there are many countries doing this, and we are among these countries. I believe this brings self-confidence and trust that, indeed, if something goes wrong, we are able to do it. And uh, again, every time a country has something to add to its security layers, it's less likely that somebody attacks it. We compare our security situation and our reaction to a hedgehog, you know, a tiny animal which you don't bother to bite because it's terribly painful. Uh, I think that was uh, it, and I uh, just want to say thank you very much for uh, sharing your insights and uh, your important perspectives on the security challenges in the Baltic region. And I also want to say thank you very much to you for showing up and to coming to this uh, seminar and, and asking good questions, and I just want to wish you a, a good day from now. Thank you, thank and you. thank you, Norway, to being part of our defense capacity in Baltic Air Police and in Lithuanian EFP. Thank you.